Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. I'm Lauren Richmond, and today I'm welcoming Nicholas Warnes to the show. Nick has a Master of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary with an emphasis in worship theology and art, and is the founder and executive director of Cyclical. He enjoys the regular pattern and rhythm of being both the executive director of Cyclical Inc. and director of Cyclical LA in Los Angeles. Nick is also a recognized speaker on church planting, international church planting coach, and the president of the board of the Church Planting Initiative at Fuller Theological Seminary. Nick finished his first book in 2014 with Dr. Mark Lau Branson called Starting Missional Churches, Life with God in the Neighborhood. More recently, Nick edited Faithful Innovation in 2020 and authored Deconstructing Church Planting, which we'll be talking about today. Nick lives with his wife, Whitney, and son, Lee, in Los Angeles, California. Nick, anything else? Uh, I guess we should start off by something we, we were talking about. Uh, Nick, like me, works from home with little kids, so who knows? We might all have little voices in the background. Uh, be patient with us, and we'll, we'll try to make the best of it. Um, what else would you like our listeners to know about you, Nick? Oh, I'm just grateful that you would include me again. Thanks for getting word out on this book. And yeah, look forward to chatting with you here and see what comes out. Cool, cool. So I can't remember. I think we talked last year probably, but I'm curious, like, how have the last two years challenged your own faith, your own ministry? You know, I I tie it to a lot of the struggles with new and existing churches. I'm sure you have been walking with a lot of people and hearing lots of stories. Mm -hmm. And it's like this deep sense of lament um, for what's gone on. Um, And then also kind of matching it is this deep sense of gratitude of the, the adaptability and the grit and the care that pastors have put in Mm -hmm. um, to, to, um, to do their thing. I think, you know, as I know you've talked about uh, consumer models of churches were um, have always been a challenging thing for me and to see consumer models of churches happening in pandemic settings in churches that we've helped to start. Um, people not wanting to participate in Sunday worship services because they're on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of stuff uh, gets me a little frustrated. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of conversations about that. But over, I mean, I, I mean, this balance of some lament and then obviously some some really impressive stories of, of both pastors and the people of God continuing on to try and follow the Holy Spirit in their context um, in the in the challenging context they find themselves in. Yeah. What is something that's kept you grounded, you know, faith practice, something you've done, hmm. kind of something healthy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my mornings are uh, important. Uh, I try and uh, read and I try and do, I became a, a yoga human during COVID. Oh, wow. So y- yoga has been my jam. I really appreciated that. And I don't know if it's okay to say this on your podcast, but some of my most holy times are uh, in my backyard with friends over some some whiskey and conversations that go late into the night. So uh, yeah, lots I remember of that you has, saying that kept me before. Yeah. <laughs> I said it twice. <laughs> I probably said the same thing before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, ah, uh, man. It, you know, it's such a such a world we're. While I was recording, this is a lot happening with SCOTUS, so I don't know about you, but certainly feeling the kind of uh, the, the the energy, uh, negative energy perhaps going around. But anyway, we're going to try to talk about some interesting things today about church planning, and you have a book that you released called Deconstructing Church Planning, Reconstructing a Post-Colonial and post-industrial pneumatology for the next generation of churches. So, Oof, man, I need a nap after that subtitle. Holy cow! Jeez, oh, Pete, <laughs> I somehow got that all out. <laughs> Why don't you give us uh, kind of what inspired the book? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, do we need another church planting book? Um, I don't know. I think that's a fair question to ask. Um, I was fortunate to do that church planting book that did well called Starting Missional Churches in 2014. And I get to read a lot of literature. I get to uh, review books um, for publishers on church planting. And just what I see over and over again with church planting books is this consistent still, even in 2022, this consistent still priority on colonialism, on Mm -hmm. colonizing through church planting, and on following equations over Mm -hmm. and against the Holy Spirit in context. So industrialized church planting. So I thought, yeah, let's do a book here. It took like three years to put it together. And uh, yeah, out it came. Kind of those are the two things that I wanted to try and raise awareness around uh, around church planting. Yeah, so you used to use that word, the in, industrial church. Well, uh, I have it for the industrial church art and complex. You said the industrial church. I don't know what you said. Something related. Kind of explain what that is and and what the problem with that is. Well, there's been a lot of industrial models for church planting over the course of the last two thousand years. Um, the most recent one has been launch large models, church Mm -hmm. planting, like an equation, right? Do three preview services, try and gather enough people. 15,000 mailers, you know. (laughs) Yeah, that kind of thing. Exactly. (laughs) Try and gather enough people to a Sunday morning, typically worship service that can justify a full-time salary for Mm -hmm. a pastor. And I just am tired of thinking and talking with people that that is the only way to start a church. So uh, I hope that we can broaden our imagination, widen our plausibility structures for how we can do this work. And uh, yeah, the industrial side of it is frustrating. I mean, the one that most people talk about in in Protestant mainline world, um, and they still think at a really high ratio is the way to start a church. And that's to buy property, typically in an emerging suburb, build a church building, stick a professional Christian in the middle of the church building, and then try and attract people based off of denominational allegiances to worship services on Sundays and call that church. So that was, you know, that's like 1945 through 1985. Right. And then, the, then the launch large model was, was after that. And there's ones before that that I named in the book as well. So the problem with it, back to your question though, is what I've experienced is people are just dead set on following the equation over and against the Holy Spirit in their context. Mm -hmm. So that's why we included the word pneumatology in the subtitle as well. We're going to, we're going to, instead we're going to follow the breadcrumbs of the Holy Spirit over and against any sort of equation given to us from a different context for how to do church in a particular neighborhood. You know, I, I listened to a fair bit of like evangelical church planning stuff like Ed Stetzer and some guys like him and it's it's even bizarre just sometimes they'll talk about folks who bailed from a church start because they weren't getting the kind of the dream launch large metrics. Yeah. Like people yeah. are like, oh, I only have 110 people. This isn't working. And it's just, you know, th- I think thankfully some of them have the, I guess, insight or awareness to say, hey, like that's a problem too. But Man, that's, it's definitely a problem uh, nationally. Yeah, I, we've worked with a lot of people who, they, I, I work with people who, who do this. They, they gather a, a, a lovely church. Mm-hmm. There's 50 people who are participating in church together and with their neighbors together. And they're just consistently living in disappointment yeah. because they're not the next thing. But I think what we quickly learned, as you probably intuit, is that no matter the size of the church... There's always a church that's a little bigger that they're always pointing toward. So that's another thing we actually get after in this book. Um, Not being so dead set on only growing memberships, Mm -hmm. Sunday commitments, tithing as like the main metrics, but instead including things that are a bit more helpful for what it means to participate with Jesus in the kingdom of God. Yeah. So... Give me some examples of things you think that need to be de- deconstructed. We've talked about the launch large model and mm-hmm. having certain numbers as, as the sign of success. What are some other examples of things you think need to be deconstructed or reexamined? Uh, a big one we talk about a lot is a shift from location, location, location to leadership, leadership, leadership. Yeah, that's good. So how do we focus on leadership over and against location? is a big one. How do we widen plausibility structures for who can lead these sorts of efforts? So for me, 
uh, the first church plant I ever heard of was a church called Mars Hill in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yeah. And I would go to their worship services and listen to Rob Bell preach. And it was an amazing three years of my life. And I really learned a lot and appreciated that. But that was my preconceived notion on how you start a church. Mm -hmm. So how do we create, not frameworks isn't the word, like guide rails for giving people extra tools for how ecclesiology can actually work itself out in different contexts. I think lots and lots of work there. And then, of course, as, as you saw in the book, like a, a priority on generativity over and against growth mm-hmm. for the purpose of actual growth happening, not just locally, but beyond that, uh, I feel like is a, a real important move we need to be thinking about. Yeah. Now, something you've already hinted at here uh, and something I read in the book that I thought was pretty intriguing was you write that leaning on denominationalism is no longer a viable protocol to start new churches. And, you know, I'll certainly speak from like my denominational context and being ordained in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Like there's not a lot of institutional money. Some regions have some. So from that aspect, you know, that's certainly the case. There's no like pot of gold. Mm-hmm. Other regions or the other denominations have a lot of money. Uh, but still, I think there's something true to what you're saying. So I want to hear more from hear more about that and what you do see as, as the role of denominations. Yes. I mean, as Christendom goes further and further into our rearview mirror, right? This is back to the post-World War II church planting industrial complex, where you just literally just built buildings on properties in emerging suburbs, which, by the way, is inherently racist as well. So that's a whole other conversation if you mm-hmm. don't have it. But uh, also there is not enough ratio and density of people who identify with a certain denomination anymore Yeah, to be able to sustain financially that sort of a model. So that sort of, mo- I mean, again, as you know, I mean, that sort of a model started to decrease in success and ratios from 1968 forward. And here we are now, and there's very few people still leveraging that sort of a model. Yeah. So, I mean, where is the role of denominations? And I mean, I think one of the things that I struggled with when I was planting a church was, you know, folks, ancillary folks in the denomination being like, hey, you know, you need to promote the denomination more. And I'm like, no one, no one who's new to this church gives a F, you know, respectfully <laughs> about what this denomination is. Like, they, right. uh, that's probably too strong. There's, they're in. They don't know. They don't. You know. They don't know what they don't know. So, right. like, what is the role? I guess. I mean, I, I'm so I'm super biased here. Yeah. So I'm the executive director of Cyclical Incorporated. And this is right. how, where we work and how we do our thing. Right. Yeah. This is a little, so a little bias I'm, you're speaking. I suppose. I'm, right? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm about to get real <laughs> biased. Um, but I think uh, I'll say a ridiculous yet ridiculously accurate sentence for where we feel like the breadcrumbs of the Holy Spirit are, are moving out. So the role of denominations, both middle, middle, upper, and upper judicatories, mm-hmm. should be to create leader-forward, post-industrial, highly pneumatological, multi-tiered relationship networks. So let me go through that yeah, because <clears throat> it's, it's ridiculous, and I fully understand that. I know. Can you no. give me that uh, in text later? <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I hope everyone gets a laugh out of that. Um, leader forward, you know, historically with denominations, it's been the denomination saying, we're going to now start a church here yeah. and then go find a person, hire a person to go start a church there. No, no, no. It's, right. It's not location, location, location. It's leadership, leadership, leadership. So we need to be nurturing faithful innovators from the ground up and then joining them in their communities for what's already happening. So that's the leader forward. Post-industrial, we already touched on this a little. I hope we talk about it more. People follow equations given to them by denominations over and against following the Holy Spirit in their context. If you do X and you do Y and you do Z, then bing, you'll have a church. And that is just not working at the same amount of ratio that it used to be working. So we're going to lean on the Holy Spirit over and against the equation given by people from an alternate context. Yeah. Pneumatological, well, we're going to follow the Holy Spirit. We're not going to follow the equation. And then don't tell anyone, but I am an ordained Presbyterian after <laughs> all. So I'm trying to be a good Presbyterian here. 
and we believe that the Holy Spirit is discerned together in community. So how do we connect people with others to help them thoughtfully discern the Holy Spirit in their context for the next steps forward? You know, as I'm hearing you talk about that, I feel like that's one of the shifts, maybe, I don't know if it's of the last 20 years of postmodernism, of, and obviously it fits within kind of our collapse of institutionalism, you know, where you can't just kind of, what's on the side of the building matters less than who's, who's in the building. Sure. And I've, you know, cause, cause I think like, I just think about like someone like, um, what's his name? Furtick or those kind of big charismatic figures. Like they could go anywhere sure. and start a church and no one's going to care what's the name. So I, obviously there's some dangers to that. Sure. Um, it's not a perfect, uh, thing, but I think, I think it makes sense. Um, to invest in leaders. So maybe let me ask this follow-up question then. Um, I think I asked your colleague, Sean Chow, this when I had him on for his rediscovering vitality book, like are, are we, and what I'll use the big, we of mainline prosthetism. Are we training leaders that way? Are we training those type of leaders? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I could say, I could just say no, <laughs> but the, but the, Really, the answer is is we're training them at too low of a ratio. Sure, yeah, that's to fair. impact difference moving forward. So yes, we are, but it's too low of a ratio um, to train people for the perfectly and technical learning skills of how to do faithful innovation. So this is a seminary conversation. This is a local discipleship right. conversation like on, on on so many levels. Uh, yeah, any rabbit trails there. Uh, happy to go down. I think it could be interesting. Uh, yeah. Which questions do I want to ask? I guess. I mean, cause, you know, I, I don't want to get too negative here. Uh, you know, I felt like for, at least in my experience at seminary, like I was trained to not to be a leader. And, and I don't know if that's too harsh. I haven't heard that one. That's a good one. You know, I don't know if that's too harsh. Um, I mean, is part of it just the realities? Like you said, we're not, we don't have enough, um, rate, the, the ratio, the math just isn't there. I think about, yeah. you know, I grew up independent fundamental Baptist, you know, that's starting with, you know, they start in youth group and middle school of training, you know, in my day, it's just boys, uh, young men up, you know, cause we don't ordain women and they didn't ordain women. You know, I don't, I don't know if that thing is happening in mainline churches of that kind of like, that kind of discipling of young people saying, "Hey, you have a, you have gifts and skills for ministry." Because there, you know, it's there. You don't go to seminary; you go to Bible college, and then you know. You, so, I don't know if if the what would be the word, just if if the the infrastructure is in place to kind of t- to bring those people along. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And again, bias here as the executive director of Cyclical, where literally we train people on faithful innovation and helping people to develop tools, again, around very learnable skills to be faithful innovators. So, yes, you're right. The ratio is too low. Uh, And also, I mean, we have 24 partners around the world who are actively investing in this Mm -hmm. uh, that are working with Cyclical. So um, it's yes and no and overarching, I feel like there's a lot of work to do because I think we all know, I and mean, we knew before COVID, right. we're not coming out of COVID, doing, this, doing the same thing. Uh, it, it's the, the ratio of success is not high enough to sustain the yeah. type of ecclesiology that we're doing. Right. Um, yeah, because I'm just, I'm just thinking back here, Nick, like the first church I served as a solo pastor was at a UCC church, and there was, a, there was like a 17-year-old kid, 18-year-old kid who was like, you know, he, he, I could tell he, he needed some like mentorship um, his mom was like, yeah, he, he's interested in ministry, but I'm like, this is not a kid who's going to go to seminary, mm-hmm. you know, and in mainline processes, where's the path to ministry for, unless you're going to like go to seminary. Um, and that was just something I remember lamenting. Like, I don't, I don't know what the, what the path is to, to mentor this young man. Sure. I mean, the race is on right now, right. For certificate programs. Uh, like that's, it's rolling at, everywhere right now yeah but the the bottom line is that 
ordination processes for mainline denominations were built for white men. Right. And that's not like leave your town, right. go for PCUSA, go to Princeton, right. Go spend three years of your life learning Greek and Hebrew and systematic theology, and then go find a call to go pastor a church. Yeah. Like those days are over, over. So yeah, what's, what's next? And I mean, to me, again, for cyclical, this is so exciting. Mm-hmm. Like I, the, the, so many opportunities. We're, so we're going to develop all these different partnerships around doing it better. And uh, I, I just hope more people hop on that train yeah. for disrupting this Christendom oriented, white man oriented sort of seminary path that is no longer sustainable for the majority of people. I mean, I don't think it was sustainable when I went to seminary started in 2009. Like, um, you know, like moving out of state was not an option. I couldn't even afford to go to the, the good seminary that was in town. <laughs> uh, um, I, w- I went to a, a good school um, that I'm proud of, but it was also like, you know, I think even then I was like, this isn't, and I, obviously there was some acknowledgement by so many schools starting hybrid and online programs. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big challenge for sure. Um, mm-hmm. of course I'd say like, I, I support like an educated clergy, but you know, the, the complicating thing is like when you talk about finding a call, like finding a job that's going to like under, under right the cost of seminary is i don't know about your context in the pcusa but in disciples world it's like harder and harder to come by i I remember learning right before i I went to fuller seminary yeah and right before i started fuller i learned that if i was a member at a pcusa church i could go to princeton for free (laughs) I should have joined the PCUSA three weeks before we were about to move. I was like, oh man, I need to transfer membership and not do that. But yeah, I mean, I I took on a huge load of student loans. And I don't know if you know this, but pastors don't get paid a lot of money. Yeah. So it's not like you're getting done with med school and you're going to go make a bunch of money as a doctor. It's just different. So again, just not sustainable. And I'm a seventh generation German white man Mm -hmm. who grew up in the suburbs of Grand Rapids. Right. Right. And it, yeah, not sustainable for me. Like, holy cow, what a mess. <laughs> well, let's, let's shift gears here from like doom and gloom. Uh, yes. Perhaps. Cause I think there's a lot of positives or at least kind of like good perspectives you share. So one thing that I really thought was intriguing, and I think we're both kind of of the same age. We, we grew up a mix, like the real, 2000s maybe late 90s 2000s like just church boom like i can drive around even denver and be like oh yeah there's the church that was you know they built up because they were booming during you know the 2000s um so during that time a church that was booming was just like let's build a bigger campus let's sell you know let's add on um whereas you talk about the need for churches to shift from internal growth to reproduction so, I mean, full disclosure, I was a pre-med student undergrad, and I finished with a biology degree. Oh. So, I believe that the church is alive, mm-hmm. and I believe that everything that's alive starts, is born, it grows, it achieves moments of homeostasis. During homeostasis, it maximizes possibilities for reproduction, and then leaves homeostasis and dies. So... From my, again, semi-biased perspective, uh, there has been way too much emphasis on trying to grow particular individual churches larger mm-hmm. over and against reproduction. So, for instance, um, Northland Village Church, a church that I was fortunate to help start in 2009. Out of that church, in the first five years, we partnered to start 15 new churches. Little Northland Village Church was never more than a hundred people. But now as those generative reproductions have rolled out and they have reproduced themselves and those grandparent or grandkid churches mm-hmm. have reproduced as well. Now we're looking at impacting literally tens of thousands of people because we prioritized generativity over and against trying to grow our thing bigger. Now we could have kept all of these things under our umbrella, right? We, we could have tried to create multiple campuses and that kind of stuff. 
but that's just again just from uh so the word here's here's a hot word for you it's uh, i don't know do you know this word biomimicry i don't i love biomimicry so finally someone named the term that i've been talking about forever so we're just copying everything that's alive wow and everything that's alive produces autonomous generativity not generativity that's tied to the parent because when the parent dies then it can take out the thing that's underneath it. Hmm. If you prioritize autonomy, then that thing can continue to go and continue to reproduce and produce things that then also reproduce. So yeah, that's again, my biased perspective, but I feel like it could be really important for the church, especially in the West Mm -hmm. in the, in the coming years. I mean, from an anecdotal standpoint, we can look at the other Mars Hill, you know um, what's his name? Mark Driscoll Mars Hill and think like, yeah, they were a bunch of, they're what they had the satellite model, right? And basically, the whole thing imploded when whatever the leader went down. Yep. Uh, I I like I think was it in this book or maybe I've heard it from you elsewhere, Nick, where you kind of say like when people would ask you, "Oh, how big is your church?" You'd be like, "Oh, we're a hundred and we're too big already. We need to start some <laughs> way <churches."> too big. <laughs> Why are we not starting more churches? Yeah, like just wait to like be playful with that kind of expectation. Yeah, I hope that becomes the norm. There's a piece in the book. Uh, the editors wanted to remove it, but I was stubborn and kept it. Mm-hmm. It was the old Andre the Giant reference. Remember that guy? Yes. Andre the Giant? Yes. Dude. So this guy had a disease where literally he just kept getting bigger. And that disease eventually killed him. You can use cancer metaphors there mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and w- without generativity, uh, everything's eventually going to die. So it's it's... I mean, again, I have a pea brain, but I'm pretty sure it's not rocket science. Mm-hmm. Unless we get serious about starting more churches than are closing, then this, this whole thing's going to continue and decline for the church in the West. Yeah. You know, even around in my neck of the woods in the Denver metro, I, c- I can think of new churches and like old mainline churches where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I, like I remember looking through some old mainline churches because I'm a church nerd, and you can kind of see like some old plaque buried deep in their old library or among some old papers about like their whole campus dream, you know, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> uh, there's also a, a big church that's a few miles North of me. That was a split off that supposedly has this huge campus. That's just like an albatross around their neck. Cause they can't afford to pay for it. Sure. That's pretty standard story, right? Like yeah. Country. Yeah. Um, so I think, I don't know if we've discussed like the different, opportunities for for growth or reproduction because obviously we we touched on you know the, the satellite model um church starting model growing bigger yourself model mm-hmm. um i don't know if there's other models you want to contrast and just kind of talk about why you think church starting is the best uh thing for church to to for homeostasis yeah i mean let's let's just go back to leadership right right leadership 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 we need to be active and open to people who are being called to leadership. And it can't be something like this. Like this is me. This is 22 year old Nick. Like I am not a preacher like Rob Bell. Right. I will never be a preacher like Rob Bell. And in order to start a church, you have to stand up front and give great sermons and attract people to Sunday worship services. Mm-hmm. If, if that's the extent of the imagination for how churches are started, it's not going to happen. So the work is identifying leaders and then broadening plausibility structures, yeah. including more tools for how to, this to happen. Anything from house churches to multi-staff mega churches, we do them all in cyclical. How do we foster that sort of atmosphere and allow those leaders to interact together to discern the Holy Spirit in community with one another? That, I mean, again, fully biased, but we've, we've seen a lot happen from that, I don't mean to oversimplify, but really that's kind of the magic sauce of what we've been doing. I'm kind of making a straw man here, Rob Bell, but I think, or not Rob Bell, Mark Driscoll, uh, but I think he can, he can, uh, he's deserved it over the years. Um, <laughs> now I forgot where I was going with that. I was thinking about the word straw man. Um, oh, the idea that, like, again, your model of like the great preacher on stage, like, cause that's who Mark Driscoll was. Like, he was a great preacher who could draw in an audience. And it kind of like fueled his narcissism. Um, I don't know if you've followed the work of uh, Chuck DeGroat, who's done a lot of good work on narcissism in the church. 
Um, but that's one of the things he talks about is, I think it's him that talks about like so much in evangelicalism, like, or maybe broadly speaking in church, like you're rewarded for narcissistic behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, jokes, jokes at Fuller all day long, the highest ratios of narcissism are in psychologists and pastors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here we all are together (laughs) doing our master's degrees. Like, Oh, what a disaster. Yeah. Well, um, so let's talk some nitty gritty here. In the book, you have what you call the four seasons of church planning. And then I'll, I'll highlight here. You had, I think it was four different, uh, testimonials. I'm not sure how you'd call it from four sure. different, uh, planters. If you're using that comfortable, using that word, sure. um, talk about kind of the, the four different seasons. Yeah. So we highlight, this is again, biomimicry, four seasons of life. I talked about this briefly earlier. The four seasons of life for most multicellular organisms are the birth phase or the birth season, movement toward homeostasis, homeostasis, and then exiting homeostasis, which lands in death. So we named those. We did some fun work around churches in different seasons. By the way, I think so much work needs to be done with churches at the end of life cycles. Yeah, we'll talk after about that. Okay, good. I won't, I won't, I won't go too far in there. But that first season, the season of birth, we identified four seasons. I'm sorry, four phases within that first season. And they are these phases. That's the phase of discernment. So we pushed hard on not just point leaders discerning, but also people who are going to make up the church discerning. Is this something they are called to Mm -hmm. the season of the, I'm sorry, the phase of the initial organized gathering. So this is, as people are coming together, typically it's bread and wine and praying and figuring out what they feel called to do together. Mm -hmm. The third season is the season of initial public witness. So this is whatever rolls out publicly that it's done well and with excellence. And then the fourth season is adapting your initial public witness, which lands on like systems of change, change management, practical theology cycles for how you make decisions for not just sticking with your initial intuitions, but actually creating systems to change, to continue to keep up with what's God doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, I was interested in reading those just the what, so the discernment, the initial public or the, the initial kind of prayer gathering. Is that fair? Initial organized uh, gathering. Yeah. Kind of prayer and discernment. Um, you know, the initial kind of public worship and then just adapting. Cause I, <laughs> the, the, the truest thing when you do anything new is whatever it is new is going to have to be changed or shifted or adapted yeah, somehow. People right? miss that so much. They think they get to like the initial public expression and that's like the end all be all. And then they're dead. It's like uh, when you're getting married, right? <laughs> like we, all the preparation that goes into the wedding. That's the wedding, but then you got to keep changing. This thing's going to keep going. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's some stuff in in the book that really hit me, and I and I think I want to talk to you about here too. Um, you talk about needing to care for those risking failure and being in vulnerable vulnerable positions. So this struck me, and I'll try to I'll try to speak gently here. Um, so my, the church I was leading closed a little over a year ago and it, you know, it was, it was a decision by people above me and I found it very frustrating, uh, and obviously still hold some emotion about it because it was kind of like sure. the two people who I worked for, basically they both had their jobs and I got a month severance and, you know, yeah. I struggle to form words for it because it still sticks with me because so I appreciate those words being written, but I think like, how do, is there a way to solve that problem? Hmm. Hmm. Well, first of all, I'm sorry that happened. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. And I can, I can feel the nuances that all bleed, bleed into how that impacts multiple people. Right. Um, people who start churches, take greater risks than people who go to work with existing churches. Mm -hmm. And because of that, 
how do we set up systems, not just for obviously finances right. is a thing here, but, but like you said, different contexts have different amounts of finances. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a contextual thing. Right. But how do we set up people with community, with friendship, with collegiality, with therapy, with spiritual direction, all those things. I think people really appreciate when you show up pastorally with a whole connected system to be able to walk them through the difficult seasons in the life of a church. It's a really big deal. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for, again, if it's going to be a middle governing body or middle judicatory, and they're just like saying, we're going to start a church over here and we're going to hire a person. That person's going to do it. Damn it. They're going to get it done. And they, there's no, there's like no intersection of, of relationship, of, of, of dreaming and a vision together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do we all work together through both the goods and the terribles yeah. of what happens when you start a church and support each other through it? If you can get there, I think you get a pretty good head start to uh, sustaining people through the risk they take on when they start a new church. You know, I was listening to my my last message that I gave and I was preaching on the farewell discourse in, in John's gospel. And I remember one of the, the points that I saw from the text was just like Jesus speaking to his disciples, like, hey, there's going to be some ruffled feathers here. There's going to be some conflict. And I think just – I think maybe this is – maybe if I can share this for, for those who are in charge of church starts or Nick for yourself or whatever. Like, And we're going to talk about this here more in a second even, Nick. But when stuff ends, like it's clunky, like there's going to be clunkiness. There's going to be miscommunication. There's going to be stuff that doesn't go as planned. And like just being aware of that from the beginning, I think will help kind of smooth over rough feelings. Cause like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, like, like, a, like there's a reason like family is just getting huge conflicts around funerals. Cause there's people are just raw because they're grieving an unexpected loss. And then, you know, all these past stuff comes up and just kind of explodes. Right. Yeah. Lots of room for being gentle with yourself. Lots of room for grace there. Yeah. Lots, lots of room to wear that primary lens of grace as people walk through those times. Yeah. That's a, that's a really tricky leadership and pastoral kind of setting that people find themselves in. Yeah. So speaking of tricky context, I think one of the things that struck me, um, and I, we were talking about it kind of before we started recording, that I, I really appreciated you you adding it to the book, um, was you shared a little bit of the story of uh, you, the church you started, Northland Village, uh, going through a, a bit of a crisis and ended up closing. So if you want to talk more about that, uh, kind of some some thoughts on that, whatever emotions you're holding, and then kind of... Uh, lessons you think are helpful for others to hear. Sure. It's hard to land this book. Like where do we land this thing? Right. And I wanted to get a little vulnerable in the landing point and really um, bring some of these thoughts to the ground. So in short, um, I retired from Northland village church in I think 2017. And uh, I was fortunate to see them make a great transition to the next pastor And unfortunately, that pastor had multiple counts of sexual harassment against him, like three years into pastoring. And uh, so many things exploded as a result of that. And yeah, last August, I was invited back to share at the last worship service of of the church that we started. Holy cow. Talk about a moment where you know you're alive. Yeah. I was feeling, I was feeling things that I've never felt and it was, yeah, it was uh, an important moment, I think, in my life. Um, but I'm, what I'm really proud of from that church is that they chose to end well. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could have kept going. They had the money to keep going. They had the, the income to keep going. They had the people to keep going. But they realized they, they didn't have the energy. They didn't mm-hmm. have the bandwidth. They just yeah. went through very acute trauma. Right as a result of what happened from the multiple sexual harassment cases and to see them say, yeah, every church has a life cycle and this is the end of our life cycle was an important piece um, to experience on that day. And then they also noted, which is where I ended the book as well, 
of all the different things they started. And I don't know what the final number was, but let's just say 20 different things that they partnered to start. They realized that their DNA goes on now. Mm -hmm. They could have chosen to keep all of these things under their umbrella and they could have grown to be a real big thing. And I'm sure there would have been magazine articles written about it. It would have been really cool podcast talked about about it <laughs> but they chose to just give it all away and create space for autonomy for the new expressions and I, th- I think this is kind of where i landed the book like thanks be to god yeah because when that mothership experiences the explosion now it doesn't take out all the little daughter and son churches that happen um that happened through the life cycle of the church so, yeah, I mean, it was really, it was hard. It was like a tear fest. I mean, I have never been more nervous to speak publicly. Hmm. And this, it's a, this is a group of like 80 people, yeah. right? And I was like preparing and just um, existentially um, maxed out from having to do this. But also, I feel grateful to have the opportunity to have done that at the end of the life cycle of this mm-hmm. church. I don't know. Maybe this is my own bias, Nick, because you know I I talked to like some pastors after my church closed who closed down a church and like yeah, and there's some like you know obviously they're disappointed when you know the church they're part of closed down. I I don't know about you, but to me, there's just I don't think it's even close call about the level of to me it was just devastation. It was just devastating. Um, And I frankly spent the last year, you know, 14 months just frankly grieving and trying to recover. Um, So, you know, I'm sure like you in Northland Village, you you pour your heart and soul. I mean, like Sunday mornings, I'd get up at like 6.30 a.m. You know, I worked to like 2.30 just straight through, just sweating to death in this hot, school building you know <laughs> right, right. Uh, and i loved it you know I, I loved it i'd do it again yeah i think two things come to mind there um one is i don't want the end of northland village church to define the work of northland village church over its life cycle yeah so what my wife and i often say is you know what that was like 12 years of some pretty damn good church mm-hmm. I'm, I'm grateful yeah, the, the the ratio of good in that was higher right. than a lot of churches that we we hear about and work with now. So there's that, yeah. And and then yeah, the flip side of it is um, there's a reason why I restarted therapy at the end of that church. Yeah, and uh, there is no landing point, at least for me yet. There there is no like period at the end of the paragraph. There, there hasn't been resolution. There's still broken relationships everywhere. And it's, I mean, so this church too, remember this church is focused on reconciliation. Oh, it's second Corinthians five church on um, creating spaces for reconciling relationships and to have it end with these huge walls built against relationships that have been going on for a decade is literally gut wrenching and still continues to be so. So, yeah, I mean, I feel you, man. I empathize with you. That's a, that's a difficult thing to go through and, Compare that and contrast that with like an existing church pastor who goes in and helps the church to end its life cycle. Right. Like they lean on like sociology, they lean on post Christendom, like, oh, this is this is you know, this is the direction it was going, and I'm gonna help like hospice this church into the end. And that's still really hard work and really noble work, and I'm really grateful for the, for the people that do that. But it is totally different than the thing that you helped to start. Yeah. I mean, like you, I kinda leaned on and have been leaning on and just this idea like something doesn't have to last forever to be good. So that's been helpful for me to have done good work. That's a good line. I like that line. You should put that in the tagline. Pretend like I said it. (laughs) No, no, no. You said it. That's a really good line. Just give me, I'm sure I heard it somewhere else. Um, So, all right, let's take a break. Uh, I don't know about you. This has been some great conversation. Hopefully it's helpful for our listeners. Um, Let's take a break. Come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with Nick Warnes. Am I saying that right? I always forget. Warnes, right? Yeah, you're getting it. Warnes. Okay. W W A R dash N I S S. Warnes. Nis. Nis. You know, 
Well, this is some real hot podcast talk here, trying to pronounce names, pronounce names right. So, so good right now. Um, some closing questions. I already gave you the fun Pope questions, so there's some more like heavier questions because uh, uh, you know, f- hopefully you can handle these. Um, since I've warned oh, you, boy. Out, since I've warned you out already here, <laughs> um, what do you think the next two to five years will look like for pastors and churches? Hmm. Um, I feel like the most important thing that the church can do in the next two to five years is to close churches well. Yeah. To promote the Good Friday to Easter Sunday motif. We have a church here in Los Angeles that is literally like selling off a third of their parking lot at a time to sustain yeah, the that's church. that's not well. We're not doing that anymore. That's done. We're, we're over that. And we're going to help churches close well, mm-hmm. and we're going to help to promote faithful innovation and resurrection as a result of it. So for the church, is that, yeah, pastors, I, I think um, being radically mindful and honest about their own social well-being, their own mental well-being, their own psychological well-being, and having spaces to be vulnerable about that. Um, I don't know if you've experienced this, Lauren, but... There's not a lot of people who just can't wait to run back to worship services. <laughs> so I'm like the only you, one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, preconceived notions of what it means to be successful needs to change. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just, you know, what I always lean on for better or worse. I always lean on Eugene Peterson's book, The Pastor. Mm. Here, what it just means to be present with people and to be caring and local um, feels like that. That sort of flow feels important right now for pastors as they uh, work through this time. And then to be honest, when it's time to end, it's time to end and don't hurt your family. Don't hurt your friends. Don't hurt yourself as a result of the stress you take on from this work. Yeah. And the next thing is going to be present. God's going to be faithful and they're going to be okay. So however we can then help them to be okay in those transitions also feels really important to my work right now as we work with people going through that kind of stuff. Yeah. Are you talking about the contemplative pastor? The book? No, it's just, I think it's just called the pastor. Okay. I could, I could be wrong, but I think it's the pastor. There's one I had to read uh, a section of called the contemplative pastor. Um, okay. I recommend. So I'm sure whatever Eugene Peterson put out, probably good, whatever it's mm-hmm. called. Yes. Yes. Um, His grandson, Drew, is a cyclical director in Spokane. Oh, wow. And he is amazing. That's fun. Uh, yeah, you got to check out his stuff. He's a really talented guy. So you've kind of given some church leader advice. Do um, you want to do the five to ten years? Have you have thoughts that far ahead? Yeah. So we, we so we just did this exercise with our board. Um, so I, full disclosure, I cannot stand BHAGs. Remember that term, the BHAG? Oh, it's been a while. BHAG? The big, hairy, audacious goal. Oh, yeah. Remember that? I think it was right. Collins from Good to Great. Sure, sure. And so many people would promote their BHAG, the five to ten year kind of frame. And so that has already officially been deconstructed Yeah, uh, with regard to a new priority on adaptive leadership over and against BHAGs. And then you throw COVID in there mm-hmm. and it is officially done. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can't stand the BHAG, but full disclosure, we did just do a BHAG exercise with our staff and with our board. And we didn't do it to change anything, to, pr- to promote anything, but to kind of learn what God's laid on our hearts and trying to find lines of alignment to then press into those as we go forward together. And that was, it was semi-helpful. But yeah. Um, no thanks on the five to 10 year question. Um, create practical theology cycles of adaptability and follow the Holy spirit and Lord have mercy. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I can live with that. Uh, well, where can people connect with you and cyclical? Um, cyclicalinc.com would be great. A uh, place to get started, cyclicalchurches.com, cyclicalfullcircle.com, cyclicalpublishing.com, cyclicalla.com. Those would all work um, to get connected. But yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Uh, in the book, literally, I started with, if you want to talk, I will talk. I will meet with you. I will continue to meet with you if you're interested in these sorts of things. So sincerely, with any of your listeners, anyone wants to connect, you can email me, nick at cyclicalchurches.com. And I would love to set up a coffee online or in person, depending on where we are. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, Nick. Uh, May God's peace be with you. Thanks for having me, Lauren. Appreciate it. 
Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.